Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> Thanks for inviting me to come along. So I'm a bit wary that I'm speaking to a room full of experts in perioperative medicine and I'm going to be giving a talk about some perioperative medicine. So, But hopefully what I'll bring to the table is build upon your knowledge of what frailty is and how that sort of impacts on your sort of day-to-day processes and, and working with these individuals and patients. And hopefully this will become a rhetorical question by the end of it uh, where frailty is a useful concept and we'll work through why that is. So this was obviously an important document back in 2010, an age-old problem, and we'll spend the next 25 minutes dissecting the the 180 pages of this document. No, don't worry, we won't do that. So we're going to look at some definitions of what frailty is, some pathophysiology, what are the two common models of frailty out there at the moment, um, and then how do we identify it, and then what do we do about it once we have identified it, Uh, and then just bringing it back to your sort of daily practice and routines and what it means for perioperative management of older people with frailty. So these are sort of numbers showing the changing demographic. Um, The number of centenarians over the next 20 years will quadruple. (coughs) This has impact on not only the NHS, but social care and spending and budget. So this is not new to anyone, I'm sure. And this is a pictorial representation of of that same sort of information, population pyramid, looking at how the Christmas tree-shaped uh, uh, sort of uh, picture will become more top heavy with older people look more like a coffin rather than a pyramid um, so we need to start with a definition don't we, what is frailty and there is no universal definition of what frailty is yet but there are, there are some key themes to, to the 2A definition sometimes it's really easy, so the lady on the left there is apparently the oldest skydiver in England uh, in a 1995 or 96 or something, so she's fairly fit and well Um, The gentleman on the right is from a care home, he's in a wheelchair, he's got mobility problems, so he's probably going to have some degree of frailty. So the end of the bed eyeball test is still very, very relevant, but there's always a grey in the middle. So the Oxford Dictionary doesn't help us. The condition of being weak and delicate is not scientific at all. So in sunny Florida in 2012, many international European agencies got together, sarcopenia, nutrition and uh, gerontology to try and really pin this down as a world consensus meeting on on frailty. And they came up with this sort of definition, which has some key sort of concepts within it. So it's a syndrome, multiple causes, diminished strength, endurance, reduced physiologic function. And I suppose this is the key thing. It increases an individual's vulnerability for developing increased dependency under death. So it's that susceptibility, it's that vulnerability is the key aspect to the definition of what frailty is. Um, age is related, is one of the risk factors. As we get older, you're more likely to be frail. Um, and that's partly because of multiple physiological systems, dysfunctioning, malfunctioning as we get older, neuromuscular, neuroendocrine, hemat- you name it. All sorts of systems are, are deteriorating and, and uh, not, not functioning as they used to. Sarcopenia is a large part of frailty. They overlap, but they're not uh, the same thing necessarily that's age related lo- loss of muscle mass and function and some people think quality as well which is a newer concept vitamin D deficiency impacts on muscle there are vitamin D receptors in, in skeletal tissue food intake again related to not only calories but protein and muscle um, and we know that metabolically there is a, there's increased cytokine production in people who are frail what we don't know is whether that's causative or associated with the multiple comorbidities that these people usually have there are lots of endocrinological changes that happen, so there's more catabolism and less <coughs> anabolism. Um, and this is what we can really get involved with, is optimising their comorbid conditions and minimising inappropriate prescribing in polypharmacy. Um, and this is um, taken from uh, some work that Andrew Clegg did and initially Linda Free did, looking at the frailty syndrome as a cycle particularly looking at sarcopenia. So if we start in this sort of side of the, uh, the diagram, age-related loss of muscle mass and function, reduced exercise capacity, strength and power, reduced walking speed, they become more dependent, functional limitations, reduced activity, the anorexia of ageing, we eat less as we get older, chronic undernutrition state, negative energy balance, and then you're back to sarcopenia. So this is a spiralling cascade, which left unchecked is obviously leads to poorer outcomes for that, for that particular individual. So specific for frailty now, 
Again, we know it increases with age. In the community, it's about 10% prevalent uh, for 64 to 74-year-olds. Obviously, in hospital, because we're seeing people who are vulnerable with an acute problem, the prevalence of frailty is much, much higher for acute admissions. Um, and women are almost twice as likely to be frail. And part of that is to do with peak muscle mass as well as... So we know peak bone mass changes and osteoporosis risks are increased, but peak muscle mass is also less in, in women. That's part of the reason why they're, they're more likely to be frail as they get older. And this is another key slide, which, again, Andrew Clegg has summarised beautifully, uh, sort of diagrammatically, what frailty is and what that actually means conceptually. Um, so imagine two people, one, one a fit older person represented by the green line, the second is a frail older person represented by the red line, and at this point in time the same thing happens. It's either a fall, medication change, an infection, an operation, and, and what you can see is that the fit older person has a dip in function, they recover rapidly, back to full function, and then they get on with their day-to-day -day life. Those people who are frail, they have a much larger dip in function, they drop below the line of dependency, they take longer to recover, and they may or may not achieve their uh, pre-morbid functional state. And that's a really powerful way of, and hopefully that's one of the key messages to take away of what frailty is and what it means for that person in front of you. So the two theoretical models that are out there are frailty as a sort of phenotype or accumulation of deficits model. And they've been proposed by Linda Freed on the left, who's an American geriatrician and epidemiologist, and Kenneth Rockwood, who's the, uh, developed the accumulation deficit model. He's a Canadian geriatrician and neurologist. So we start with Linda Freed's model, frailty as a phenotype. She looks at five domains phenotypically, so fatigue, low physical activity, weakness, slowness, and weight loss. If you have none of those things, you're robust, fit. If you have one or two, you're this interesting category of pre-frail, where interventions may reverse frailty, perhaps. And if you have three or more of those, then you're deemed as frail, as per that classification. And taken from the same paper back in 2001, um, she's shown that people who are frail are more likely to, to die, to be in hospital, to have a fall, a functional decline. And this is a very long sort of retrospective study, three to seven years, uh, looking at the data. The accumulation of deficit model. So Ken Rockwood is... Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard him speak, but he's a great speaker. He comes out with these great quotes. So, and he's really simple. Uh, he's made the concept quite simple. So the more things individuals have wrong with them, the higher the likelihood that they'll be frail. It makes sense. Um, but it comes back to some, sort of, some cellular um, theoretical modelling that he did, looking at accumulation of cellular deficits, leading to organ dysfunctions, leading to systems dysfunctions, leaving you with an individual uh, with frailty. So what does he class as a deficit? So it can be a symptom, it can be a sign, a disability, a disease, a lab measurement, or, or sort of reflect multi-system involvement, states, poor mobility. So researchers obviously have too much time on their hands. So his original sort of list of problems and deficits was 92. And, and this is one of the early research in frailty indexes um, uh, of 70 points. And there's a whole list of things there which you can uh, see for yourself. But the way an index works is you have a list of deficits and you count up how many of those deficits the person in front of you, the individual you're assessing, has. And you end up with a fraction or a ratio from 0 to 1. And if, you have, if the score is more than 0.25 or a quarter of the list, then you're deemed as frail. And there's a physiological maximum of about 0.67, where if you have more than two-thirds of those <laughs> issues, yeah, it's barely compatible with life. So, um, so there we go, there's an upper limit. So... We've moved on from that. This was sort of 10 years ago now. We know that you have to have more than 30 for, for something to be robust. 50 makes it particularly robust, but more than 70 adds no precision. So most of the indices out there have 30 or so. And these are Captain Mayer curves looking at both models. So they're both validated models looking at mortality and survival. So the top one is the Linda Freed phenotype model, showing that if you're frail, you're less likely to be alive seven years later. And the uh, Rockwood Frailty Index model, again, the higher your frailty index score, the less likely to, you to be alive uh, seven years on later again. So the big elephant in the room, I've talked a lot about physical frailty, but actually they overlap with, with cognitive frailty. And what we know is that cognitive frailty is associated with similar adverse outcomes to physical frailty, but if you have both together, it's bad news, it's synergistic, and it, and it, and it can make your outcomes even worse. 
This was a nice paper from Age and Aging back in 2012. The first slide is looking at hospital inpatients um, and their mortality, again, Kaplan-Meier curves. So the, the first slide just demonstrates what we've already just shown about survival. Those who are frail, the green line, are less likely to be alive compared to fit, fitter people. Um, the, second, the second slide looks at people who are frail with delirium. So the curve shifts right down to the left, just emphasising that synergistic negative outcome associated with fra- the physical frailty and cognitive frailty. And there's an even newer concept that's emerging now, social frailty. So if we, if we go back to that original concept, which hopefully you'll take away, is that vulnerability, susceptibility for an older person when they come into crisis. If you imagine someone who lives alone, has no neighbours, um, no carer support, uh, lives on a farm, and if they have a fall or come into some sort of bother or crisis point, they're going to be more likely to struggle and call for help. So social freighter looks at social support, socioeconomic status, accommodation, marital status, living circumstances. We know that by itself social frailty is an independent prognostic risk factor for mortality and poor outcomes. Um, it's linked with loneliness as well, which is another big topic for the, for the British Geriatric Society at the moment. Um, increases with age, more common in women again. And this is again another survival curve. Just for, for social vulnerability or social frailty, the, the higher your scores, the less likely you are to be alive, the bottom dotted line there. So how can we identify it? So there's lots of tools out there. It can be very confusing. Um, and they're all named, you know, there was a time where if you wanted to be famous, you'd just develop a frailty index and put your name on it. But we've, we've come forward a long way from that. Um, I'll make a particular mention of the Edmonton Frailty Scale, however, because that has been validated in a perioperative setting, and we often use this in a preoperative clinic setting. It's multi-domain, so it looks at cognition, health status, social support, medication, nutrition, um, and it scores out of 17. Um, And and if you're 8 or more, you're mild, moderate, or severe, and there are cut points for each of those sort of uh, categories. It takes about five minutes when when you know how to use it and you're up and running with it. Um, but it also helps to focus any intervention. So if you identify problems with social support, you can identify a resource there. If it's more to do with cognition, they may need d- dementia support, mental health support, or whatever else. Um, so I'm sure some of us <coughs> remember what the geriatric giants were. They, they, they were still called that when I was at medical school. Um, instability, immobility, insanity, incontinence, and hydrogenicity. And what we've done is we've revamped them and made them modern and convert and, and made them frailty syndromes. So these are red flags now. So anyone who presents or has this sort of non-specific presentation with these issues, it probably means they have an underlying frailty issue or frailty syndrome. Um, so how do we manage these patients and what do we do about it? So these are the, this is, again, another key slide, key message to take away. Comprehensive geriatric assessment. Show of hands, who's heard of CGA? Excellent. Good, good number of you. So this is basically our secret weapon, our black box methodology for managing older people frailty. And it's not rocket science, it's, uh, I was going to say neurosurgery, but there's probably people who've seen that, and I don't know how difficult or not that is, but anyway. Um, <laughs> CJ, it's not, it's not difficult, but it means doing the basics well and, do, and making sure we're not missing anything. And this is evidence-based, so just like angioplasty, just like endoscopy, just like all of the interventions that you do which have an evidence base, CGA has an evidence base. And this is back in the Lancet paper back in 1994. And it describes what it is. So it's a multidimensional, interdisciplinary, diagnostic process determines med- medical, psychological and functional capabilities of a frail older person in order to develop a coordinated and integrated plan for treatment and long-term follow-up. Now some of this you're already doing without even knowing it, but it just helps to conceptualise what it is and that there is a strong evidence base behind it. And it comes back to these five domains. So medical, psychological, social, environmental, and functional. So it's not just looking at the haemoglobin uh, preoperatively. It's looking at the whole patient and making sure that anything that we can optimise or change or modify, we can we can have a look at before they go for that major surgery. Um, so, yeah, so under the medical sort of thing, that's the things that we do every day, looking at conditions, medication reviews, nutritional status, problem listing, um, mental health, so cognition, dementia, mood, anxiety, um, functional capacity, um, social circumstances, networks, carer support, and then the environment at home, what support do they have, telehealth, telecare, etc. 
And I'll make a particular note about medication reviews because I think actually, st as a geriatrician still, I think the biggest difference I make when I see someone, both in the short term, medium and long term, is doing a careful and thorough medication review. And it's a simple, simple thing we can do. They say that you know, that's the surgeon's scalpel and this is the geriatrician's scalpel. You know, so we pharmacologically debride their, their prescriptions and charts um, just to make sure... because. Um, the, and you know as well as anyone else that the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetics change with older people. They, they don't tolerate the tablet. A lot of the tablets for frail older people, these people aren't in drug trials. So the statin that they're on is, has no evidence base anyway. So you're already in a grey zone. So cutting back on inappropriate medication is important. Equally, you may find someone who's not frail and they need to be on warfarin for their AF. And that's fine. So it's mainly about stopping inappropriate things, but also thinking about starting things that they should be on, particularly if they're not frail and... and the outcomes are there to be had. And there are tools there to help us. There was the BEERS criteria initially, which is more an American sort of uh, tool. And then in, uh, in the UK, we've got stop-start criteria. Version 2 is out now. And it's a very useful prompt adjunct to um, prescription and medication reviews. So this is important. So CGA does not equal a geriatrician. So complex geriatric assessment does not equal geriatrician. We sometimes get referrals from orthopaedic wards or surgical wards, rather, saying, please, doctors, I'd come and do a CGA. So we'll talk about why that doesn't work. Hopefully you can see why that doesn't quite work in practice. But it's actually a misnomer, not just on the G, but also the C and the A. So comprehensive might make you think, oh, my God, this takes five hours or days or weeks. But it really depends on the, the assessment that you have and what domains, are, uh, what, what are you picking up on those individual domains? It might be it's more the medical side, it might not be the medical side, it might be the functional aspect. So comprehensive, yes, but it's also focusing and targeting. And it's not just an assessment. So it's not just, here's, here are the problems, off you go. It's generating the problem list and making an action plan, a bespoke, individualised care plan for that patient. So you have to work in a team. It's not just a geriatrician. So this is my sort of ward team that I work with. You have a nurse in charge, myself, physios, OT, social workers, uh, ward staff. I also work in the community, so the team is slightly different, but it's a team nonetheless, community matrons, myself, GPs and other people. But you need a team, and I'll talk more towards the end about what the perioperative frailty team might look like. So we start with your assessment, make a stratified problem list, bespoke management plan, and then goal setting. And we go around, so it's an iterative process, so it's not a one-stop shop. So I can't just come and do a CGA. It means following on the plan and going through those processes and maybe finding new problems. Problems go away, problems get better, new problems emerge. So it's a dynamic process, which doesn't stop for inpatients, doesn't stop at discharge, it goes back to primary care. And so there's, there are issues with transferring information backwards and forwards, and I'm sure the same is true of clinic work that you do. Um, so these are the key sort of landmark meta-analysis reviews um, that were done more recently regarding CGA in hospital. Um, and in summary you're more likely to be alive and more likely to be at home six months after a CGA intervention in hospital. Um, and these are the forest plot diagrams are showing that from the BMJ review. So you're more likely to be alive and more likely to be at home. So the, the key thing is CGA, um, but there is emerging evidence uh, around exercise, nutritional supplementation and vitamin D. So we know about exercise, it, it has to be resistance and aerobic training, it has to be strength and balance, it has to be prolonged like most of the falls prevention work, it has to be over three months, weeks. Um, nutritional supplementation, so younger adults need 0.7 grams per kilogram per day of protein and older people, there's evidence that actually need more than that because of the catabolic state I described earlier. Um, we know it's synergistic with exercise, the effects of uh, protein supplementation. Vitamin D is always controversial. But if it's deficient, we need to correct it. Uh, I'll leave it at that for, for now. So just a bit more on exercise. Again, it should be multi-component. The intensity and volume, we're still evaluating what that might look like, and people are looking at different regimes. But an example might be three sets of 8 to 12 reps, starting at 20%, one rep max, increasing to 80% three times, uh, three times a week for 12 weeks. Um, there are people looking at high-intensity interval training. You know, so there's some translational work from what we know about younger athletes who are training and building muscle. And, and exercise is primarily targeting sarcopenia, but not only sarcopenia. And as you can see from what I've just said, obviously, 
it tends to be more beneficial in the earlier stages of frailty than later stages of frailty because they're not going to be going down to the gym and bench pressing and doing weights and all those sorts of things. Um, but exercise not only improves physical function but cognitive function as well. So it helps with cognitive function and mood. And we know from dementia studies that how important exercise is. So coming back to what it means for your day-to-day -day lives. So there is a challenge with perioperative medicine for older people. So there's an increasing number of older people undergoing surgery, and that's because you guys have got newer techniques. Surgeons have got newer, more advanced techniques. We're operating more people who are frailer. But we know that older people frailty are at an increased risk of adverse outcomes. And that's partly because of frailty, their polypharmacy, their multimorbidity, and all of the other things we've talked about. And um, <coughs> Jagdeep Desi and uh, Harari have been sort of pioneers uh, as geriatricians in leading the way forward to perioperative care in older people. Um, and this is taken from their paper looking at outcomes. I just wanted to highlight the, the impact of frailty on surgical outcomes. So increased length of stay, morbidity, delirium, uh, mortality, and also discharge to care home, which is always potentially a tragedy where if we haven't been able to optimise things beforehand, you're then moving, you're changing the destination of a patient from their own home to a care home, and that can, that's um, a drastic change for, for the patient more than anyone else. So why should we identify frailty preoperatively? So it helps, it, first of all, it helps with that discussion that you have with the patient. It adds to that risk-benefit um, discussion that you have with the patient. Um, Dale was talking about this sort of moral balance. And if you've got frailty there in the mix, we know that it affects outcome. Um, so it helps with the education. And, and I often have those discussions on the ward, whether, whether, it, whether I'm planning endoscopies or other tests, or just talking about medication. Adding in frailty into the conversation just helps to... Con conceptualise the risks and benefits of, of an intervention you're proposing. But it, more than that, it helps to prompt proactive CGA and identifying and optimising modifi modifiable risk factors, which will hopefully improve post-operative outcomes and reduce op uh, complications post-operatively. So, developing services, you must have a way of recognising what frailty is, as well as the end-of-the-bed eyeball test. We need to have systems em embedded in place to identify frailty uh, with, with objective scores as well. They're adjuncts. You still need... So all the scores and tools that are out there um, are adjuncts to your clinical assessment. They don't diagnose frailty per se. They help to identify a group of individuals with adverse outcomes, but you still need that clinical assessment to confirm um, that test. So preoperatively, we can work through CGA principles, management of comor comorbidities, prehabilitation, so optimising function before the operation, looking at malnutrition, anaemia, uh, delirium, so being aware if you're frailer, you're on more tablets, you've got pre-existing dementia, that your risk of post-operative delirium will be higher and anticipating that. Um, and then also thinking about the uh, capacity where relevant, obviously, if, people, if, if you're making these complex decisions, thinking about consent and ethics, and the use of the Mental Capacity Act where, where, where necessary. So I've only written a line on the intraoperative section because you guys will know much more about that than I will. But there is evidence from papers that particularly in older people, hypothermia, hypotension, hypoxia are related to adverse outcomes in particular. And then post-operatively, the last slide is just going to be an outline of the team, but it's going to be, you need a shared clinical working environment. There's going to be different people making different assessments, having different um, opinions to bring to the table. So you need to have a shared clinical working and decision-making environment. Recognition and uh, early recognition management of post-op complications, setting appropriate ceilings of care, um, mm -hmm. early mobilisation, so the, uh, enhanced recovery programmes, adequate analgesia, delirium management, and good communication, um, not only amongst team members, but with patients, with families, with, with other members of the team that are working. And you must have some sort of MDT meeting, because as I said, you'll have different people going in at different times, see, and making, giving an opinion, but the MDT brings that together. That's where you can bring all the bits of the CGA together in one place to then move the plan forward and drive things forward. And that ties into the discharge planning, which starts from day one, thinking about how far are we going, what's the functional outcome here, and then starting to plan things early, rather than leaving them till the last minute. So the final slide, just looking at 
what a perioperative team should look like. So it starts with the pre-assessment team and then the ward staff, um, the anaesthetist, the surgeon, the geriatrician, um, therapists, allied healthcare professionals. Four-fifths, so four out of those five domains are not medical. They're usually therapy or social services led. So you need to have good therapist support for any CGA service, not just dealing perioperatively. Any CGA service needs to have good therapy and allied healthcare professional support. We have to be supported by commission and hospital managers. Uh, and then the final point, just about education and training. Um, uh, so like today, um, uh, I'm going to another talk later this, this afternoon looking at ED frailty and how we manage frailty in the ED. Um, so it's about edu frailty is a relatively new concept. And again, it's not all geriatricians have quite got their heads around it either. So it's trying to get the word out amongst health professionals. And then actually the, the, the bigger agenda is getting it out to the public and telling them what frailty is and, 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 and there are issues there. We, we know from um, um, sort of PPI groups that they don't like the word frailty, they don't want to be called frail, it's very ne it has negative connotations. So there are issues there sort of longer term regarding that. But education and training is important for us. And we have to think about alternative medical workforce structures because we're all understaffed. Uh, there's not enough of us to go around. There's certainly not enough geriatricians to go around. Um, but thinking about advanced nurse practitioners, physician associates, which we have embedded in our frailty pathways and processes here at NUH. Um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So I'm happy to take any questions.